Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about how in 1999, a player on TC returned to the school all because he read an article in Sports Illustrated. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. I know this is going to sound like a crazy and a foreign concept, but there used to be a time where the Los Angeles Rams actually had a first round picks. Crazy, I know. And even though the Rams were not good in the 90s at all, as with the exception of their Super Bowl winning season in 1999, they had a losing record every year and never made the playoffs, one of the bright spots came in 1991 with one of their first round picks, which is the man you're watching and the man you're going to become very familiar with throughout this episode. This is Notre Dame cornerback Todd White, and he was chosen fifth overall in 1991 by the Rams to bolster up a pass defense that in 1990 was second to last in passing yards allowed, third to last in passing touchdowns allowed, second to last in yards per pass allowed, and sixth to last in interceptions forced. This helped contribute pretty badly to their 5-11 record and a defense that finished with the fourth most points allowed in football, allowing 25.8 points per game. The pick made a ton of sense for the Rams on paper, as Todd White seemed to provide immediate help at a position that desperately needed it. And man, did the Rams hit a home run with this pick. Todd White is remembered today as one of the best cornerbacks to ever play for the Rams, as in his 10 seasons with the team, he started 137 games and recorded 31 interceptions. He was durable, starting every game from 1994 to 99, and he played a big part in that championship team from 1999, making the Pro Bowl, being named a second-team All-Pro by the Associated Press, and having six interceptions, which was the sixth most in all of football. During that 1999 season, he even had a pass breakup in all three of the Rams' playoff games, including Super Bowl 34 against the Tennessee Titans, and had an absolutely massive interception at the end of the first half of the NFC Championship as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were driving. In what would turn out to be a thrilling, albeit highly controversial, 11-6 victory to send the Rams to their first Super Bowl since they moved to St. Louis and their second one all time, their first coming in 1979. The Rams had been around for a long time, being around since 1936, and yet, White ranks fourth in team history in interceptions, as he's one of just four guys, alongside Eddie Metter, Nolan Cromwell, and Lee White Irvin, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, to have at least 30 career interceptions with the team. I think everyone would agree that White was a fantastic pick by the organization and was a clear-cut example of the first-round pick working out exactly as advertised. You can't really complain about those numbers and that production. But what you might not know is that Todd Light was never supposed to be chosen a pick number five by the Rams. He was never supposed to last that long. Instead, he was supposed to be the second overall pick in the draft. It was supposed to be the New England Patriots with the first pick, before they traded the effort Rocket Ismail spurned the NFL to play in the CFL, so really, the Dallas Cowboys with the first pick, and then, Todd Light going number two to the Cleveland Browns. And Light lost tons of money on his contract, and his draft stock took a beating, thanks to a bizarre controversy involving a quote that Light may or may not have made, and may or may not have been taken completely out of context in an act of the media being dishonest. If White was going to be the number two pick and go to Cleveland before this, he sure as heck wasn't going to be after. Because this is the story behind the bizarre controversy at the 1991 NFL Draft between Todd White, the Cleveland Browns, a reporter, ESPN, and a whole bunch of other parties. Before I talk about just exactly what happened during this controversy, we need some context to understand just who Todd White is and why the Browns, at pick number two, coveted him so badly at first. White was one of the best cornerbacks at the time in college football. And not just that, but he was one of the greatest cornerbacks in the history of Notre Dame football. Over his four-year career with the Fighting Irish, not only did he win a national championship in 1988, 
after Notre Dame defeated West Virginia in the Fiesta Bowl, but he had 11 interceptions, which ranks inside the top 10 all time, and is the most that any Notre Dame defender has had in the last 40 years. During the 1989 season in particular, when Notre Dame finished second in the AP poll with a 12-1 record, and had a defense that was only allowing 14.5 points per game, which was the ninth best in Division 1A out of 106 teams, White had eight interceptions, which was the third most in school history in a single season. White is the only defender in the last half century in school history to have at least eight picks in a single season. And the only men to top him on the all-time single season list are Tom McDonald, who had nine in 1962, and Mike Townsend, who had 10 in 1972. His 20 and a half career pass breakups ranked fourth in school history at the time. He was named the captain in 1990 during his senior season. He was a consensus All-America selection in both 1989 and 1990, and was a finalist for the Jim Thorpe Award in 1989, given to the best defensive back in the nation. If you were to argue that Todd White was the greatest cornerback in Notre Dame history, honestly, I'm not sure how many people are going to fight you on it. He was that good. In fact, he was so good that not only was he projected as a first-round pick, and not only was he projected as the first defensive back or even the first defender off the board, but he was projected as high as the number two overall pick in the entire draft class. He was going to hear his name get called really early on and was set to make bank. And when it came to the team that had the number two pick, as in this team right here, well, it became incredibly obvious why they would look toward drafting a guy like Tom White. Remember when the Cleveland Browns made the AFC Championship three times in four years and made the playoffs in five straight years? Yeah, it's tough to remember that the Browns entered the 1990 season having done that, because in 1990, they were a complete disaster, changing coaches midway through and going 3-13. I did a video talking about how big of a train wreck they were that season already, so you can learn more about that disaster by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And part of why they were the second worst team in football, just one year after being the second best team in the AFC, was because of an abysmal defense that allowed 462 points, or 28.9 points per game, ranking dead last in the NFL. Their pass defense played a big part in that, as no team allowed more passing touchdowns than the Browns, who allowed 32 at a time where the league average was 20, and at a time when another team in their division, the Pittsburgh Steelers, only allowed 9. Felix Wright was the only player on the team to have more than two interceptions. He had three. He was a safety, and was going to be 32 years old in 1991, so he was way past his prime. No quarterback on the team had more than two picks, and the two starting quarterbacks they had were incredible players and were the best starting quarterback tandem in football, if this was 1987. But by this point, the combination of Frank Minifield and Raymond Claiborne was easy for opposing quarterbacks to pick on. Minifield had the worst year of his career and was going to be 31, and Claiborne had the worst year of his career and was going to be 36. Again, these were your starting quarterbacks before the 1991 draft. So not only was this a bad secondary, and not only was this an inefficient secondary, but this was an old secondary. A really old secondary. Youth was desperately needed. Talent was desperately needed. Everything was desperately needed. And that's where Todd Light fit into the equation. And again, Light was projected to be the pick, or at the very least, go super high in the draft. As New York Giants general manager George Young said, knowing that his team, after winning the Super Bowl, had no chance whatsoever of getting Light to fall down to them, he's fast, smooth, and strong. The questions people have about him are his ability to cover deep and as an aggressive hitter. Those are not questions in my mind. And one writer was so confident that he said in the wake of the Ismail drama with going to the CFL, all you need to know about the 1991 draft, I guess, is that Todd White is the consensus number two pick. 
This seemed like you could sure be it in. It seemed like the worst kept secret in the world that Todd Light was going to be a Cleveland Brown. There would be no drama whatsoever. And that's when things changed pretty drastically. Because before the draft, Light was speaking with a reporter over the phone in a typical pre-draft interview. And what should have been a ho-hum, fairly generic interview, turned out to change the game forever. Because at this interview, Light was asked about who he wanted to go to in the draft, and was asked about where he wanted to play his football. And Light said, I would like to play for anybody, even Cleveland. Those two words right there at the end completely tanked his stock. Even Cleveland. When you add a qualifier like that, it makes it seem like you really don't want to play for them, or don't consider them to be an NFL team, or don't consider them to be a serious organization or a desirable destination, or you consider that the last place in the world that you would want to play. It's almost like if you're looking for a job and someone asks you how the job hunt is going, and you say, I've been applying everywhere, even McDonald's. It makes it seem that you're more qualified than working at McDonald's for minimum wage and would rather work anywhere else and you really don't want to get the job there. But you're doing it because you just won't work, even if it feels beneath you. If you want another example, it's like if your parents ask you how school was today and you say, it was good, even science class. It makes it seem like you usually hate science class for whatever reason and that it's miserable, and that it's some place that, if you had your way, you rather wouldn't be. You would be in a different class or whatnot. That qualifier makes all the difference, and truly shows your opinion. And in the eyes of Brown's owner Art Modell, that was all he needed to hear. Why waste to pick on a guy who completely dissed the city like that? Why waste to pick on a guy being disrespectful to Cleveland? Because if there's one thing we know about Art Modell, it's that he truly cared about Cleveland and couldn't imagine why someone wouldn't want to try and make money in the NFL there. However, as Modell said after the draft on Light's rather rude remarks, I know what he said and how he said it. He said he would play for anybody, even Cleveland. None of us have to defend the quality of life in Cleveland. 47 of our players live here in the offseason. That speaks volumes for a community and organization. This idea about going to a vast wasteland, it's not fair to the great people of Cleveland. Translation, we don't want a guy who feels like Cleveland is a third world city that has no business being in the NFL. We don't want a guy who disrespects our fans like that. We would rather get someone that wants to be here, will embrace the community, and won't throw a fit and look for a way out. And because of those comments, according to what Modell said, and according to ESPN commentator Fred Edelstein, the Browns took him off their board. If that interview never happened, and if those comments were never made, Light was going number two. Instead, he dropped to number five, and was chosen by the Los Angeles Rams. Just like that, tons of money lost especially because he went from the first defensive back taken to the third. However, if you thought that's where the story ends, just you wait. It's only getting started, because we haven't even scratched the surface with the drama surrounding this quote and this report. Number one, turns out, the quote itself was a complete lie. Todd White never said that. What happened was that the even Cleveland part was added by a reporter. Light would have had no problem whatsoever with playing in Cleveland. As Light said, I did an interview on the phone and the reporter asked me where I'd like to play. I said, I'd like to play anywhere. He said, even Cleveland? And I said, yes. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. In other words, the quote was completely editorialized. This guy either had no idea how to use quotation marks, or did and just didn't care for the truth. Light did nothing wrong whatsoever. He said he would like to play anywhere, and then was presented with a yes or no question, 
and he answered yes. And somehow, the reporter in question completely twisted his words and made it seem like going to Cleveland was a death sentence. Even though that was never said, the part that Art Modell was furious about, as in the even Cleveland part, that was added by the reporter. This was absolutely terrible journalism, absolutely irresponsible journalism, and downright dangerous journalism, considering what it did to his reputation and his draft stock. And number two, Art Modell then decided to attack ESPN for saying that White got taken off their board and was no longer going to be their pet after he dissed the city of Cleveland. I'm not sure why he did this, seeing as Modell flat out said that he saw the quote. He hated it and said how disrespectful it was and that he wanted players who would actually embrace Cleveland. So this was a weird approach because it seemed like the truth. But Modell decided to debunk that rumor by putting ESPN on blast. As Modell said on Edelstein, he's right about 1 out of 20 times. He's an 050 hitter. He couldn't even be a utility infielder for the Cleveland Indians. I don't think Bob Woodward used him as a source for the Commanders, with that last part referring to a book that came out that year about the Bush administration and their military tactics. He then continued, saying, The report is ludicrous. Freddie Edelstein hasn't been right since he was born, and I doubt whether he was right then. He must have hit it lucky. That's Freddie Edelstein. He throws things up against the wall, and whatever sticks, one out of ten, he considers himself a guru. I don't think he's going to make anybody forget Edward R. Murrow or Ernest Hemingway. What we learn from these quotes, aside from the fact that Modell really loves literature and name drops authors like Lou Bega name drops women in Mambo No. 5, is that Modell really hates Edelstein. Again though, I'm inclined to believe Edelstein on this, seeing as Modell came out in a press conference and bashed Light for his comments. So it feels like those two statements contradict each other, don't you think? Either way, the two words of even Cleveland caused such a mess for about 10,000 different parties and completely alter the 1991 NFL Draft. Then again, I'm not sure that Cleveland was complaining too much about who they got instead, seeing as with pick number two, instead of taking Todd Light, they chose this man right here, Eric Turner, and he turned out to be a very good pick for the team. He played with the Browns all the way up until their relocation to Baltimore after the 1995 season, received votes for Defensive Rookie of the Year in 1991 and Defensive Player of the Year in 1994, and helped guide the Browns back to the playoffs in 1994 for the first time in five years after starting all 16 games for them that season while being named a Pro Bowler and an AP First Team All-Pro, all while recording nine interceptions which was the most in football that season. In 1994, Turner became just the third player in Brown's history to lead the league in picks, alongside Tom Darden in 1978 and Felix Wright in 1989. And he was even named the AFC Defensive Player of the Month for the month of December 1994 for his efforts. You could actually have a very good debate and discussion about which player had the better NFL career and which guy was the better pick and whether that was Eric Turner or Todd White. And you have to wonder if Turner would have not even made this a discussion and blown past Light if it wasn't for the tragic way that his career ended, when he died on May 28, 2000, at the age of 31 due to stomach cancer, reportedly losing 70 pounds in a four-month stretch from the last game he played in 1999 to one month before his death. Having said that, I think both the Rams and Browns were pretty happy with how the 1991 NFL Draft panned out at the top. Eric Turner was a great player for the team for a long period of time, and Todd White was a great player for the team for a long period of time. Everyone wins, which is one of the few times I can actually say that in one of these videos about a bizarre draft controversy. That usually doesn't happen. And I don't think White was complaining about going to the Rams seeing as he won a Super Bowl eventually, had a long career there lasting over a decade, 
and his agent, Bob Wool, said after he got drafted, he has great endorsement opportunities that don't exist, frankly, in Cleveland and other cities. So the people close to him didn't seem too upset about the minor slide, both at the time and in the long term. But still, the fact that two words caused chaos and were two words added by an irresponsible reporter trying to insert himself into the story, which is the last thing any reporter should do, make an ill-advised joke and improperly use quotation marks is absolutely crazy. Because if Todd White was truly going to be the number two pick and was truly penciled in to go to Cleveland, let's just say the article that came out did not lighten the mood. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.